so that we can be educated and uh, understand uh, the role of the church, the iron sharpening the iron, because that's what all that is. Iron sharpening iron is just simply uh, the church or the persons judging a matter amongst themselves, and then they sharpen each other in understanding, in your maybe your belief, uh, a teacher, you know, we have teachers in the kingdom of God. That's what that's all about, is teaching someone. Hi, I'm Sandy Powell. Welcome to the Roundtable. And I want to say that it's been a great 2020 year. We're starting off with uh, what I believe is clear vision, clear understanding, uh, knowing clear purpose in our lives as believers. And so one of the topics that I definitely wanted to tap on in this new year is judge me or don't judge me. That is a phrase that is rampant in the church uh, amongst believers. Um, we use this phrase commonly to deflect. We will say this statement uh, if there is a correction made or something said to someone that uh, is to deter them from a behavior or an action uh, in order for them to not feel the conviction of God, we'll make that statement blankly. Just don't judge me. God is my only judge. And uh, I've heard this over the years. I've heard this many times said from many levels. It's not just the young, but we have the old that say it. It, it, Facebook is riddled with all the little uh, cutely, cute little uh, sayings with different ways of making that same statement of don't judge me. But it's not biblical. It's not uh, uh, biblically sound. There is uh, no scripture that, will, that doesn't support that the saints have a place in judging unrighteousness. And so today on the show, we're going to talk about that and we're going to give scripture so that we can be educated and uh, understand uh, the role of the church, the iron sharpening the iron, because that's what all that is. Iron sharpening iron is just simply uh, the church or the persons judging a matter amongst themselves. And then they sharpen each other in understanding, in your maybe your belief, uh, a teacher. You know, we have teachers in the kingdom of God. That's what that's all about, is teaching someone uh, something that they may not have understanding about. Because if I think I know something, and then I'm taught something differently. I've just been uh, brought from a, the place that I thought I knew to a place of understanding. And sometimes that's what we, uh, uh, we have a tendency to deflect, is that teaching, training, and development in the kingdom of God by saying, don't judge me. So we're going to get right into the scriptures here. I'm just talking a little bit today because the one thing that we have to understand about the kingdom of God is that backsliding happens. There is backsliding happening in the church, in the, in the house of God every day. But if no one can say anything to someone about backsliding, how do we bring them back to a place of understanding, a place of recognizing that they're in a wrong place or in a place uh, of, uh, of back turning? Unless we come to a place of understanding that someone has to give a word or someone needs to tell them that they're in a, uh, in a bad position. So just so that we can have scripture uh, to back up what I'm saying, I'm first going to go to Jeremiah. And Jeremiah uh, uh, 3 and 13 through 15th verse, um, it talks about how God is married to the backslider. He talks about uh, how we can find ourselves turned away from God, doing things that God has not uh, sanctioned us to do or that he's not pleased with. Now, we have to know as a body of believers that we don't always do things the way God say do them. And so if we find ourselves on a wayward way in the kingdom of God and what we're doing before God, 
just like in the days of old, we cannot think for one moment that nowadays we don't do the same thing. We have to know that there is a place that sometimes we find ourselves that God is not pleased with. Well, if no one can tell you that you're in this place that you're not supposed to be, how will you find your way back? If you get to use the phrase or the quote, don't judge me. So that's why I say we have to get rid of this statement um, that we're using to deflect. Now, when they say don't judge me or when they're speaking about don't judge me, see, the judgment that I believe that they should be talking about is when a person uh, actually convicts you and damns you. See, we don't have that. We don't have that authority. We can't damn you. We can't judge your, a jury and executioner with you. But we can recognize when a person is not in the right place or are not uh, operating the way that the Lord will, will have them to be in the kingdom, and we can call that out. And that's not judgment. That's recognizing and allowing the conviction of the Holy Spirit to rest on you. Because sometimes when we find ourselves in this place where we're not doing what we're supposed to do, we've already heard the Holy Spirit. We've, we've overridden the Holy Spirit. We've already uh, uh, heard within ourselves not to be in this place, but somehow or another we've either convinced ourselves or allowed others to convince us that we're good when actuality we're not. And so uh, then now the Lord will use other avenues, people of the earth, saints, to come to you to, uh, to, uh, to pull you back or to, to beckon you back to a place that God will have you to be in the kingdom. And so uh, for that reason, I, I wanted to read Jeremiah 3, uh, 13 through 15. And I'm going to read it in the um, NLT. And then I'm going to read it in the King James Version for all those who just love the King James Version because I don't want you to think that I don't recognize it in the King James Version as well. But in the NLT, it reads, starting with the thir 13th verse, it says, Only acknowledge your guilt. Admit that you rebelled against the Lord your God and committed adultery against him by worshiping idols under every green tree. Confess that you refuse to listen to my voice. I, the Lord, have spoken. Return home, you wayward children, says the Lord, for I am your master and I will bring you back to the land of Israel from this town and to from that family, from wherever you have scattered. And I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will guide you in, and, and with knowledge and understanding. So we have to know that we, when we get in the place here, they're talking about in, 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 uh, in the natural, in geographic or whatever, but in the natural, we wayward children. He's talking about wayward, getting away from him, having turned from God, back, backsliding, going away from the things that God has instructed us or given us. But he says here in the King James Version, in verse 14, he says, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And I will give you pastors according to my heart, which will feed you with knowledge and understanding. See, because somewhere along the line here in this passage of scripture, they got away from knowledge and understanding. And so this is why we can't dismiss or silence the voice of the pastor. It, that's being done on a regular basis. We are lumping every pastor with one pastor or maybe two pastors. And we're saying uh, that that pastors aren't about this or aren't about that. In actuality, God has put pastors in this earth for them to give us knowledge and understanding. But somewhere we're silencing the voice of the pastors, which is allowing the enemy to come in and to spread whatever rhetoric that he wants to spread because no one has to, uh, to take heed to what the pastor's saying. So we find ourselves further and further away from the things of God because we're not first listening to the voice of God through the man of God or the woman of God that God has placed here in the earth. So we have to find ourselves going back to what God has established. We can't just use our blanket cliche words to deflect or to uh, get away from hearing the conviction that the Holy Spirit is giving us about our ways. Now, if for us to think that we're doing it all right all the time, to me, that is just what I call um, ignorance. For us to believe that we don't need someone to instruct us, to give us understanding about where we are. 
Every one of us have someone that we should be accountable to, someone that we should uh, be able to hear from them what the Lord is saying. Because although we are in, in the fivefold, I'll just go right there, the fivefold ministry, we feel like uh, it, it, that we can't hear from another in the fivefold, then we're absolutely incorrect because the Lord will use whom he will. And we have to be uh, uh, knowledgeable to know that we don't have it all. No one vessel has it all. We all have to be able to hear the voice of God through whoever God uses. Because although we may feel like we're the head honcho of something or the head honcho in the kingdom, we have to know this one thing, that God will use whom he wants to use. And so if he decides to use uh, this little poor little, little chick from Brooklyn, New York, then bless be God. Open up your ears and hear what thus saith the Lord. And not feel like, uh, who is she to direct me or to give me some understanding? Because this is the thing. I speak not of myself, but only uh, what the Lord has given. And we have to be able to submit ourselves to that type of hearing. To be able to hear as a body of believers what God is saying to whomever he's using and, and getting the message out. So with that being said, we have to extract this statement of don't judge me. Our young people are running rampant with this statement uh, because they they don't like the hand like like we didn't like it. I'm not going to just pick on the young folk because we didn't like the hand of judgment or the hand of um, uh, correction or direction on us as well. We rebelled as well. We just back in the day, you know, we didn't have a whole lot we could say about it. We could mumble it on our voice and don't be heard. Uh, but we still didn't like the hand of correction on us. You know, the Bible talks about that, 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 that correction is grievous for the moment. You know, it grieves us, it bothers us when we're corrected. But later on, it will yield the fruit that it's supposed to yield when you're corrected, and when it's, when it's put in place. But we can't push back and pull back from correcting because people don't like it. Because God says it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to bother us like that. It should bother us. It should bother us in some ways to have that correction we sh because we're stepped to the left or we're out of pocket. And so um, I would go down here to, uh, let me get this other verse here I wanted to, to bring out. Because uh, this is the one that, that they use so uh, <laughs> carelessly, don't judge me. And I wanted to um, strip that. In scripture if we go to 1st Corinthians 6 yeah I know roundtable I went to a Bible study but it's all good we, we're gonna learn something because uh, like I, I said early on in the in the opening of the show uh, this is the year of clear clarity where we have to open up our eyes and see what the Lord is saying we can no longer walk in our own ignorance in our own understanding, not just a, in our own understanding. We have to hear what the Father is saying to us from on high. And for us to, uh, to, as believers, to go through this life and feel as though nobody can tell us anything or no one can make a correction to us, even if we're called the, in, in, in whatever capacity that you feel yourself called, and the chosen, because I know the chosen try to step to the side, yeah, just talk to the call. But even the chosen have to understand that there are some direction and instructions that we must submit ourselves to. I know that in uh, many uh, persons in the Bible th that, that did great things and mighty things for God uh, in Scripture, Moses and, 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 and Aaron and uh, all of these people uh, that have done great things, have walked in error. Adam, they, they walked in error. You know, Adam being the, the, the one that God created from the, from the onset, you know, and, 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 and walked with him in the cool of the day. At the end of the day, he needed some instructions. He needed somebody to keep him in guidelines. So we as the believers, as the called uh, and the chosen, we have to understand that we are sometimes going to get out of pocket. And we have to be able to submit ourselves to somebody that will come and have a word from the Lord for us to get back in place or to, to strip ourselves of these things. Uh, because the, mainly the, 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 uh, I have seen in, in, uh, in the kingdom is that we, we, we fight the things of this world. We fight not letting go of the things of this world is the reason why we say don't judge me. 
where like when we talk about, you know, don't be drunk with wine, you know, don't judge me, only God can judge me. Plus, you know, you know, you can drink wine, wine is in the Bible. I understand all about the wine in the Bible, but when the Bible tells us to not be drunk, then we can't come back and say, well, don't judge me because only God can judge me. That is absolute untruth. And I'm going to show you right here in 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6, and this is in the King James Version. It says, dare any of, it's starting with verse 1. I'm starting with verse 1. It says, dare any of you having a matter against another, go to the law before the unjust and not before the saints. Sounds like it's about to be some judgment from the saints, sound like to me. Verse 2 says, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? See, I could stop right there and end the show, but I'm not. I'm going to give you some understanding. The saints are going to do what? Verse 2 says the saints are going to judge the world. So where do we get this statement that don't judge me? You can't judge me. Only God is my judge. And this is the thing about that statement. It is absolutely correct that God is the only judge. He's the one with, with, with the law. But you've got to understand when God sends someone to you, with that law, with that understanding, it is from God. It is his judgment to you. It is his thing that he's bringing to you. It's not that person. I just sit down and write something up, uh, a law or a standard or a principle that God, you know, uh, for you. I am bringing to you God's principle or either God's standard or God's law. And so therefore it is not my judgment. It is his judgment. And all I'm doing is delivering the message. So when you say only God can judge me, then yeah, he has. Then yes, he has come. He is bringing a judgment. Now what you're doing is being in the natural and the carnal, and you're rejecting it only because it's coming through a natural man. But the judgment of God is written in, is plain black and white in Bible. And so when someone speaks the word of God to you, you can't dismiss it because it's coming through a man. Because the same man, if he was to tell you that God is going to bless you, uh, to be a millionaire uh, in, in 30 days, see, then you shout around the church. And then we'll be uh, able to accept that and say that that's, you know, God used them mightily. Well, God will use them mightily to tell you to get in order, to get yourself in order, to, to, to pull back from this area or pull back from that area, to not set yourself amongst uh, uh, non-believers and, and be uh, uh, a dim light. See, that's the same, the same man that brought you the, you're going to have a house on the hill, is the same man that he says, come from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. But we, we pick and choose when the man or the woman of God is bringing the word to us or, or, or capable of bringing to, the word to us or bringing a, a, a judgment. Because if I say you're going to be wealthy, that's a judgment. But it's not mine, it's God's, because only God can give it to you. Oh, it, well, man could give it to you, the enemy could give it to you. But when I say it in that way that it's something to your liking, then you find a, a way to be able to embrace that. But let me finish this scripture here. Uh, verse 3 says, know you, know you not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? He says in verse 4, if then you have judgment of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. He says in, this, in, in verse, uh, go back up to verse 2. He says, and if the world shall be judged by you, are you worthy to judge the small matters? So in other words, he's saying in this case, you know, because they were bringing each other before the, the lawmakers here on the earth about matters that pertain to, you know, be between believers. And he was saying, why are you taking these small matters or taking these matters before non-believers? Don't you know that you're going to be judging the world? You're going to judge angels. And you mean to tell me you take this small matter and take it before heathens, non-believers to settle it? So basically he's saying, so if you should be able to judge these small earthly matters amongst yourselves and not take it before the heathens, because one day you'll be judging the world. You'll judge the world and you'll judge the angels. So surely start practicing that right here. Go ahead and put it into play. I'm going to read that because I know you're not going to believe me when I say it. Uh, go down to... Uh, if Verse 4 says, if then you have judged of things pertaining to his life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that you are not a wise, that, 
that there is not a wise man among you? No. Not one shall be able to judge between his brethren. Shall not one of y'all be able to judge between the brethren? Can, can, you, can y'all not sit down? Is not one wise enough to sit down and judge? You mean to tell me I can't tell when a person is walking wayward? When I have, this is the thing I do. I know what I looked like when I was walking wayward. I know what backsliding looked like because I've been a backslider. So when you see someone walking in a, I call backward motion, we should be able to call that thing out because we recognize it. I'm judging this matter. There's a discernment in me uh, by way of the Holy Ghost that you can tell, you can see when a person is no longer focused on the things of God. And when that happens, do we not feel like we have a, a, a right or, or that we have an, a, a duty to keep this person uh, with their relationship with Christ in the, right, in the right perspective? We do. And sometimes, you know, we, even when we do things that we feel like are uh, good, you know, we say, well, you know, it's, this, this is something, it's a good thing. But if it's not a God thing, Sometimes we need to hear just when God says, not now. It might not be the time or it might not be the place or it might not. But when we don't allow people to speak into our lives that are really authentic from God to give us instructions and corrections and directions, we are going to miss the mark, even though we may feel like we're called and chosen. So we've got to get away from that statement of that blanket statement of don't judge me. The, uh, the enemy is allowing that statement to be used so that we any and everything goes. But we as believers know any and everything doesn't go. So sometimes when we're at night, when we're wrestling and can't go to sleep or we feel like, you know, we got to have something to help us rest at night. Sometimes it's just a disobedience that we're walking in. Sometimes the, the, the uh, Holy Spirit won't allow us to be in perfect peace. Because we are walking in disobedience and, be, and we can't have this lukewarm thing about us. You know, one minute, uh, you know, I got to go talk about Facebook. One minute on Facebook, you know, we, we, we praying and, 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 and we're calling on the name of the Lord and this, that, and the third. And then the next minute, you know, we, we post it up in a club. You know, which one are we? Which face is true? And so we can't, you can't, light has no, no association with darkness. And then people say, well, Christ, you know, he, uh, he, he sat amongst the, the tax collectors and stuff. Yeah, to teach them something, not to get down with them. See, we try to piece together how we want to do it. We'll say, well, Christ, you know, he, he, he sat amongst the, the, the ungodly or whatever, whatever. And that's the absolute truth. But he was there at, in, in a, as a light to draw them to him. But when the darkness draws you, now you in the club shaking your thing, see, who drew who? See, th- that's, where we, that's where we get it mixed up. And if you don't have the strength to resist and be amongst darkness, <laughs> to be the light, if your light get dim when you get around darkness, you need to stay away until your strength is there. See, but if I said this to someone, the first thing they'll say is, don't judge me. Don't judge God's people. You know, when we talk about sins and things that God is not pleased with, the first thing we say, well, God is the only judge. You're absolutely right. And he has given us his, his principles and his statutes line by line. And so, therefore, I'm holding what God has said, just the same way as we do with uh, the city ordinances that say 55 miles per hour is the speed limit. Well, just because I own a car doesn't mean I get to do 60 and 70. You know, I, I still have to abide by, you know, for me to, when the police officer was to stop me and say, you know, you've been doing uh, 70 and a 55, I, I can't look at that police officer and say, don't judge me. Who are you to judge me? You're not, you're not the judge. You're just a police officer. He's a law keeper. He's the one that, that has been ordained to keep the law, to keep those who are breaking the law, to let them know you're breaking the law, and he upholds the law. Well, then you can call us that same thing then. We're, we're police officers of the kingdom. So when people go around breaking the law or, 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 or not walking in the, in the statutes of the Lord, then when, when you called out on it, don't catch, don't catch this don't judge me attitude. Because this is going to keep you in the bondage. 
You know, when, I, I know with me, when I was in my dark places, I was blind. And I had no way of understanding how to get out. It took someone with light to come in and get me. It took God's light to come in and get me because I was blind. I thought what I was doing was right. I thought what I was uh, participating in was good. And I was good to go. And if someone had not come in and spoken life to me, I would have still been stumbling in the dark. Well, some of us are stumbling in the dark because we got people who are sanctioning us. But just because they're sanctioning you doesn't mean that you are good. Because God is calling for the standard uh, of the church now. We have, we have walked so, uh, uh, I say, so crooked and so um, lowering the standards of God that now we have gotten so far from where it originally started that, you know, we, 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 it, it, it's mixed now. You know, now we have a little bit of the, the, the house of God and a little bit of the club. You know, just keep it, keep it going. Just make sure people happy, make sure people good to go. In actuality, we have, we have gotten away from the statures that the Lord has set. And now we use our, uh, our blanket of cover of don't judge. You know, when we, when we talk about uh, sin in any form and we, we get the I don't judge. I have to go here. Uh, when we talk about homosexuality, people automatically try to label people who talk about homosexuality, I have to say this, uh, that we're hating. It is the most untruth that you can say. There is not a human being that I have a hatred for. None. And to include those who may be practicing homosexuality. But if you practice homosexuality, I have to tell you that the Lord is not pleased. And so when I say God is not pleased with your sin, I am not saying that I don't love you and God doesn't love you. No, God loves us all. He says in the word of God, says, for God so loved the world. So if you're in this world, he loves you. So that it eliminates that thought right there. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish. So we're not saying we don't love. We're saying that God hates this practice. And this is a practice you should not do. So when we say, well, you don't have a right to judge who God, who loves who, um, I didn't. I'm repeating what he said. <laughs> this is what God said. I, I'm, just, I'm just mimicking what the Father has already spoken. And so somehow or another, I don't know how we can take the scripture and dismiss it altogether. And, and just act as if it doesn't exist, like that part of the Bible doesn't exist. And that's not just in homosexuality, that's in adultery, that's in fornication, that's in any of this. Any sexual immoralities, God is not pleased with it. And if you're practicing it, see, see, that's the thing. We've all probably done some sexual immoralities. I have. But I'm not practicing it. You can't practice sin and be good with God. That is, it, it, it's like the Holy Spirit dwelling in us doesn't let us sit comfortable with practicing sin. And so when you find yourself cool with practicing sin, you are in what I call that backward motion of backsliding. And you have to find yourself uh, uh, looking to the light to come up out of it. When you now can call what was once evil good, and what was good.